Welcome to Gotta Run With Will. My name is Melanie Eversley, I'm your host. This is part three of a series on the history of black running clubs in New York City. With me is Dr. Pamela Kuperchenkin, who is author of The American Marathon and also is researching a book on the history of black running clubs in New York. At the end of part two, we were talking about Joe Yancey, the founder of the New York Pioneer Club. And so let's talk more about Joe Yancey. Okay, he was born in New York City, so very much a New Yorker. And he graduated from Saratoga High School and went to college. He never graduated, but he did uh, study at NYU. Mm -hmm. He was also and kept- Just to clarify, Saratoga High School in, in New York in City. York, in, um, in Saratoga, no, Saratoga. Oh, yeah. okay. He became a captain in the reserves of the 369th Regiment, which was New York State's first African-American military unit. So there's a lot of pride there. They, with the boys of yesteryear, help fund the track meets and help fund the New York Pioneer Club. He later went to his father's undertaking business and then became a tax collector. Mm -hmm. And so had a civil service job and started the Pioneer Club in 1936 and integrated the Pioneer Club in 1942. By 1945, there were about 100 members. And that's pretty big. Most track that's clubs huge. were about 20 or 30. Right. But again, right. it was 20 or 30 because you had to be real good. Yeah. yeah. But this was a developmental club any boy could join. Mm -hmm. In 1948, there were about 200 athletes who paid weekly dues of 25 cents, 25 cents a week, okay. to be part of the New York Pioneer Club. In 1950, at the AAU National Indoor Championship track and field meet at the University of Maryland, the New York Pioneer Club refused to stay in segregated housing. So they found integrated housing, housing for everyone. Remember, Maryland is near Pennsylvania at Lincoln University, yeah. which is a historically black university mm -hmm. in Pennsylvania. And the person who helped them get that housing was Roscoe Lee Brown, mm -hmm. who was then a dean. The actor. The he actor. Was, yeah. <laughs> the actor. Mm -hmm. okay. Roscoe C. Brown had also been a member. He was a member of the Tuskegee Airmen. Mm -hmm. So they commuted okay. from Lincoln University for their principles mm -hmm. that we go as a team and we don't go. Very interestingly, in 1950, the New York Pioneer Club won its first national championship by winning the AAU National and Metropolitan Team Championships in the marathon. And the winning team was Louis White, Harry Murphy, and John Sterner. Mm -hmm. These were all very important people in the founding of the New York Roadrunners, which puts on the marathon today. Yeah. And in my first book, one of the points I make is that the New York City Marathon and the great urban marathons all over the world came from Joe Yancey and the New York Pioneer Club mm -hmm. because they said, everybody's welcome, regardless of ability, everybody yes. is welcome to join. Mm -hmm. Those were the men who later started the New York uh, Roadrunners. Ted Corbett was its first pioneer yeah. and he brought Joe Yancey's principles with him. Mm -hmm. Everybody is welcome in the marathon. Yeah. Corbett being the Olympian, yes, the father of distance Olympian. running, and first yes. president of New York Roadrunners. Yes. <laughs> but they were all, yeah. Harry Murphy, John Sterner, they were yes. all pioneers, Louis White. Yeah. They came from Joe Yancey's principle of everybody is welcome. Mm -hmm. Actually, Elliot Denman, who Elliot was, Denman a was a pioneer. At a paper where I used to work. Yes. I had no idea I, yeah. until recently. So, yes, yeah. he was a pioneer too. Mm -hmm. But... You think of Joe Yancey with this attitude that every boy is welcome, mm -hmm. this social welfare attitude, mm -hmm. managed to start something that we ex that's all over the world. Right. Yeah. And I th I've been saying that for 25 years. Yes. Anyway, Joe Yancey did have a winning team in 1951 on February 17th. He won the senior indoor, the Pioneer Club won the senior indoor track and field championship. Mm -hmm. 
And in 1955, again, they won the championship. So 51 and 55, these, they are winning national championships. And they're holding their New York Pioneer Games, 1948 to 1958. So this is a major track meet. And in the 50s, the New York Roadrun the Roadrunners Club of America began. Browning Ross knew Joe Yancey. Joe Yancey had been his coach on one of the uh, foreign tours. Wow. Joe Yancey, by the 60s, mm -hmm. in fact, even in the 50s, he was an international coach. Yeah. But he had these ideals that you act like a gentleman, that everyone has ability, everybody is welcome. Mm -hmm. It's, it's just so fascinating to me that you have this club where, you know, the founder said everybody is welcome and they go on to win. Yeah. <laughs> Whereas these other clubs who have like these strict, you know. Um, they only wanted the good ones. Right, right. And the Pioneer Club was beating them. With nothing. That is something else that, yeah. you know, their funding was so precarious. Right. In 1958, they ended their indoor games, they just didn't have the funding. Who was their funding? The boys of yesteryear were getting older. Mm -hmm. The 369th, they were middle class. Yeah. In the black community, you didn't have the accumulated, inherited generation to generation wealth that you have in the white community. Right. right. And this was a, a problem for the Pioneer Track Club. Mm -hmm. And a couple of other things were happening about then. Uh, the Pioneer Club was declining. Mm -hmm. But think of what was happening. Harlem was losing population right after World War II mm -hmm. because more suburbs, African Americans right. moving to the suburbs, right. especially and the then middle class. I would think you also, black people were uh, acquiring generational wealth at this point you know, um, second, third generation. Um, and so maybe there was not uh, quite the need for a club that's open to everyone because I people have I think there was resources. every bit as much need in Harlem. Because who's going to move out to the suburbs? It would be the middle class. Mm -hmm. They didn't need this sort of club, but the people who were still... The people who were still there. There. Mm -hmm. there yeah, although they, their um, children needed the there club. are people who, you know, opted to stay there. Yes. That's like that's yes. a whole different yes. book. But um, uh, middle class people who yeah. like very, you know, they just they very assertively decided they were going to stay there and mm -hmm. help better the community. And, yes. uh, you know, just by their presence and figure out a yeah. way to to live there. So. And the Pioneer Club continued winning. They were winning Metropolitan Championships as late as 1970. Mm -hmm. So they were doing well through the, through the 1960s. It was still yeah. an important... John Carlos was running for the Pioneers in the early 1960s, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it meant so much to him. In his book, his parents were, incidentally, Afro-Caribbean, mm -hmm. and he came to Harlem, indifferent student, went to school. He ran in the hallways. Yeah. That was their training. Wow. And then he went to the Pioneer Club, and they were in the 369th Armory. Mm -hmm. And he said, when you got there, I'm trying to remember his book, Poverty Was Left at the Door. Mm -hmm. And they helped develop him yeah. as a runner. Yeah. He was also a Pioneer member, and he was part of that protest at 1968 Mexico City. Right. Famous so, photo. Famous. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, and the Pioneers, again, were still winning, mm -hmm. still winning championships. Mm -hmm. But in 1970, a lot happened. First of all, the Civil Rights Movement, the Fair Housing Acts in 1960, mm -hmm. four and 65, more and more African-American middle-class people were moving to the suburbs, mm -hmm. people who were in the civil service, moving to St. Albans. Right, Very, New Rochelle, Mount right. Vernon. Or in 1975, the city had a fiscal crisis. Mm -hmm. They were in tremendous debt. Right. In fact, the first layoffs occurred in 1974. Mm -hmm. They're laying off civil servants. Who is that going to affect? The black middle class. Mm -hmm. That's the, you know, that was the security to have a civil service job. Right. 
1975, they started laying off school teachers mm -hmm. and the schools were deteriorating. You know, fewer teachers, the, the facilities, the buildings weren't kept up. This was a very hard time. Mm -hmm. And then you, there you saw the decline of the Pioneer Track Club. Mm. And Joe Yancey was getting older. Yeah. He had a wonderful assistant manager, Ed Levy, who kept the Pioneer Track Club alive well into the 90s. Okay. Ed Levy, when I was writing my book, I got an interview with Ed Levy, and I personally feel that was the most important resource I used in the book. Mm -hmm. He gave, me, he gave me hours of his time, yeah, and that just made the book and helped me understand the Pioneer Track Club. Sure, sure. He, incidentally, in 1971, he became one of the first black principals yeah. in the New York City public schools. Yeah. I think there were about 10 at that time. Okay, okay. After Yancey retired, mm -hmm. he kept the Pioneer Track Club going into the 1990s, mm -hmm. but... We wonder why it went into decline, the physical crisis of the 1970s. And their resources were gone. The right. black middle class that had supported them mm -hmm. with the dances, with the galas, was no longer there. Right. But did they really decline? Ted Corbett became the first president of the Roadrunners. Sure. The Roadrunners adopted in the 19 in 1975 they adopted all of Joe Yancey's principles mm -hmm. integration everybody is welcome to join mm -hmm. and in 1976 right you know during the financial crisis mm -hmm. they opened the door and it was Ted Corbett and Percy Sutton yeah. who got the marathon uh, out businessmen mm -hmm. out into the streets yeah and yeah. what, what would be the purpose of that? Mm -hmm. To go out into the streets of New York to accommodate as many people as possible. Right. Because Joe Yancey thought every boy should have the opportunity. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So the Pioneer Track Club declined, but its inheritor is the New York Roadrunners. Right. And then we have also Gary Corbett working with other groups to yeah. kind of continue the history. Seems to me there's been a, like a boom in the number of black distance runners, I would say like in the yeah. last 15 years. And then you talk about accessibility. Um, you know, I know I've had conversations with elite runners and it's like there's, this is a sport where there are very few divisions. Somebody who is a slow runner can have a conversation about what they love about the sport with somebody who's won marathons around the world. And there's no, you know, there's that connection. You're yeah. in the same race. They may be way ahead of you by hours, but you yeah. are in the same race. Yeah. And there's not only the connection with the other people in the marathon, but in New York City, tremendous connection with the people. Right. And I remember running the New York City Marathon in the 1970s and the joyous reception we got in Harlem. Yeah. Remember, Harlem is when you're tired. You, know, you right. pretty much had it when you yeah. reached Harlem. Yeah. yeah, that's yeah. when you start getting delirious and, you know. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, it was just wonderful to run through that. Coach Sid. Okay. He, he and Asteria, they are coaches with Team for Kids, which is part of New York Roadrunners, but they're fixtures. Asteria is always at the bottom of the bridge leading from the Bronx into Harlem. Uh -huh. So that's maybe mile 20. And Asteria will always say, oh, you look marvelous. And you yeah. know you don't yes. look marvelous. And then like a mile later is Sid. He's always at the same intersection in Harlem. And he'll tell you. Hey, we have, they give you medal. You got to get your medal. Go get that medal. And, and you're dragging. But it's just the moment that you yeah. need it. And um, they, they've been at those posts for like years yeah. in Harlem. So I always yeah. associate the Harlem part of the marathon with the two of them. When I was writing this book, it was, it was originally my dissertation. Mm -hmm. And when I was writing my dissertation and writing, you know, about Joe Yancey, and for the first time seeing, you know, I was actually in a garret. You know, I had a student, you know, that's the student housing. I felt. It was lovely, yeah. but it was the attic of someone's house. Right. And... Wow. Um, actually, a charming student, Garrett. Mm -hmm. And there I was alone with papers. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a typical 
semi-delirious graduate student. Yes. I was writing this and thinking about the times I ran 78 and 79 mm -hmm. through Harlem and the wonderful reception and thinking, did they know? Did they know that this was their event? That they were the people who started it? This is their event. That yes. this was started by a black track club. Yeah. Yeah. We have to keep working on getting the word out there. Yeah. And the work you're doing is, is helping to do that. But the only reason I did it, it was fascinating. I mean, I just yeah. kept following it and following it and following it. And I got encouragement first from Louis White and then from Valerie Levy. Yes. And of course, from Gary Corbett. Right, of course. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Can you talk about uh, the book at all? I don't want you to reveal any, uh, you know, secrets. Well, it, <laughs> but, it, uh, it goes from the early black track clubs through the Pioneer Club, and it's really about African Americans getting power over track and field events. Yeah, yeah. And uh, it's, it's funny, it's being written for me because the final chapter is Rob Simulcar getting, becoming the CEO of New York Roadrunners. Right, right, right. And uh, Nana Lynch becoming second I in command. Okay, yeah. That's great when something yeah. writes yeah. itself yes. on the right track. Yeah. Well, we all look forward to it. I mean, th this has been fascinating for me because um, about 10 years ago, I started researching, I started finding out that there were uh, black running clubs in other cities. Like yeah. when I, I oh, yes. this is back when I was traveling for mm -hmm. marathons and I met uh, specifically like in Cleveland, Cincinnati, a lot of them were in Ohio for some reason, but I know there was one in mm -hmm. LA and, and uh, you know, I found their history fascinating mm -hmm. because um, just like the clubs here, yeah. there was a tie in with civil rights and these clubs just kind of yeah. demonstrating what, you know, black people can do and, and um, just kind of developing a toughness. Yeah. So, to learn that yeah. a lot of this history was happening in my own community was really valuable to me. So, you know, I'm so glad you're finding this history and you're going to be sharing it with everybody through your book. So uh, at this point, I'd like to thank my guest, Dr. Pamela Cooper Chenkin, author of The American Marathon and of an upcoming book on the history of uh, black running clubs in New York City. Thanks so much to uh, Gotta Run With Will and Will Sanchez for the opportunity and to Manhattan Neighborhood Network. And as always, Gotta Run.